We look forward to bringing justice on behalf of William Deshaun Hamilton, an unknown name and face no more. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases. And all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button, and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So today we are going to be covering the case of a previously unidentified boy given the name Dennis also known as Clifton John Doe, who now thankfully has his actual name back and his case is on the path to being solved. This is definitely one of those cases that affected me to my core when I first came across it last year, but I wanted to wait a little bit of time to see if more updates came out regarding it. This is a case that involves the murder of a young boy whose life seems to have been taken by one of the main people in his life who is supposed to love him the most. We're taking this one back to 1999. On February 26th of 1999, a cemetery worker headed to the cemetery he worked at across the street from the Clifton United Methodist Church at the corner of Clifton Springs Road and Clifton Church Road in Southern DeKalb County, Georgia. He was planning on getting a spot ready for an upcoming burial when he came across something that caught his attention. In a small wooded area of the cemetery, he saw something lying on the ground. Upon further inspection, he realized it was the remains of a child. The DeKalb County Police Department were notified of the man's findings and headed to the scene immediately. It was obvious that the spot in the field where the child was found was not the spot he took his last breath. The area showed no signs of a struggle or foul play taking place there. It seemed like this child had been gently placed there after his death, a death that ultimately mystified investigators. An autopsy was done on the child, a child that they discovered to be an African-American male, and the cause of death could not be determined at the time. If he was found sooner, they may have been able to pinpoint how he died, but there was extreme decomposition to the boy's body. The body was, in fact, skeletonized. They estimated his time of death to be anywhere between three to six months before he had been found in the cemetery. Because of that, it was believed that he had died during the last few months of 1998. The toxic the toxicology report would state that there were traces of acetaminophen, which is a common pain reliever, and diphenhydramine, which is an antihistamine. It didn't really seem though that there was enough of either of these medications in his system to have been what caused his death. The medical examiner stated that they found no signs of trauma to the boy's body, and overall it seemed like he had been well cared for in life mostly meaning that he had not been malnourished and there were no indications that he had suffered abuse. Due to the fact that they could not prove he was a victim of homicide, they could not originally rule out him dying from natural causes. They put the boy's age somewhere between four to seven years old with some later reports putting his age between five to seven, thinking he was probably older than four years old. He still had some of his baby teeth, so that better helped determine his age. His height was somewhere between three feet, 10 inches tall and four feet two inches tall and his weight was between 40 to 50 pounds some reports claim it was 40 to 60. the clothing he was found in though was focused on in his case greatly it was a well put together outfit with items that were a little pricier he was wearing size three red jean pants, a long sleeve extra large pullover hoodie that was made of two different patterns, one being light blue plaid and the other being just plain gray blue. And on his feet, he had on kids size 11 Timberland brown suede boots that had the laces double knotted. As you can probably tell, it was really the boots that were a bit more focused on because Timberland boots are not on the cheap side. Kids boots similar in style from the brand today sell for roughly $80 to $100. Keep in mind that children can outgrow shoes at that age every six months to a year. Law enforcement believed this boy had been taken care of well in life. Had his death actually been an accident? Had he been abducted from his loving home and then killed? On the outside, it did look like he was cared for, but then something horrible happened. They had no idea what that thing was and they wanted to know. They knew though that chances were that they wouldn't know the answers to those questions until they discovered who he was. For now, in this case, they decided to give him a name and they named him Dennis. They also referred to him as Clifton John Doe because of course the area that he was found in, but they rarely called him Clifton John Doe because it 
it genuinely hurt them to refer to him as a John Doe. It just felt better to call him Dennis, which was an actual name. Due to the deterioration of his remains, it was impossible just by looking at him to tell what he looked like in life. And they also could not obtain fingerprints because the skin on his fingers had decayed. They were able to get a dental chart though and eventually extract DNA. They hoped though, above all, that someone who knew who he was would come forward to positively identify him. No one did though not for many, many, many years. They even traced the product number of the shoes he had on and discovered that the shoes had been sold east of the Mississippi River, but this didn't really get them closer to finding out who he was. They combed through a copious amount of missing persons reports, but none of them matched their little John Doe. Time passed and a memorial would be held for the boy, with most of the attendees being either law enforcement or locals who had just heard of the case and wanted to come and pay their respects. A blank headstone was place in the cemetery where he had been found, hoping to one day put his real name on it. After that, they decided it was time to create a clay mold of what the boy may have looked like using his skeletal remains. Still, it didn't seem like anyone, especially in that area, knew who he was. They kept spreading the word though the best that they could. Another clay mold reconstruction would be done by the FBI, this one looking far different than the last and receiving much less criticism. People overall didn't think the original looked very believable. The department did receive some tips through the years, but not many. During October of 1999, a woman phoned the coroner's office. She was extremely upset and her voice definitely relayed that. It was hard for them to understand what she was really saying on the other end, but it sounded like she said that her name was Dawn Anderson and that she knew who the boy was. From what they could make out, she stated that the boy's name was Cabell Brown. Authorities wanted to talk to her further, but were unable to ever get a hold of her. They traced the call to the Florida Institution of Technology in Melbourne, Florida, but were never able to find her. It is believed that she may have used a false name. They looked through missing persons reports and never came across one for a child under that name. This lead went nowhere and they even began questioning whether it was a fake tip to begin with. The woman was obviously emotional though, so they were curious. It kind of makes you think, is there another case all on its own of a little boy under that name who was just never reported missing. For now, we don't know, and since that first call, the woman never called again, and she's never been found. His case ran cold fast, and through the years, there were very little updates, but they never gave up. Forensic investigator Greg Johns stated, this child appeared to be well cared for, and for him to just be dumped out like that and all these years with nobody coming by, it just makes it that much more unusual. With advancements in technology, they tried every new method available to help identify him, but they kept hitting dead end after dead end. Through further examination of his bones and teeth, they believed that he may have come from the state where he was found in, Georgia, or even possibly Northern Florida. If he really had been in an area so close, how did no one know who he was? Well, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who had helped work on his case for years, had released a previous sketch of the boy years back, but in February of 2019, 20 years after he was discovered in that wooded area of the cemetery, they released two updated pictures. One photo from a front view and the other from a side, again hoping someone, anyone, would recognize him. This time, someone did. Now we're going to get into talking about one of the most incredible and resilient women that I've come across while researching true crime cases. A woman named Ava came across the photo of the boy online and she knew immediately who it was. In May of 2020, she called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and began telling them everything she knew. This was the major breakthrough in this case that it needed for over two decades. Ava told them that this little boy's name was William and that she had been friends with his mother, Teresa, back in the late 90s in Charlotte, North Carolina. She told them that during December of 1998, she remembered that Teresa abruptly took her son out of school and left the area claiming that she was going to be moving to Atlanta, Georgia to be with relatives. Ava said goodbye to the boy she cared for like her own son. She would later tell a &E TV, we said each other's name, William hugged me and I hugged him, we kept hugging. She had to practically pry us apart to get him back in the car. That was it. That's the last time I saw him. Then Teresa and William left and Ava never saw him again. Sometime later though, Teresa returned to Charlotte, North Carolina. 
It was later on in 1999, but she was without William. She gave story after story, all completely different, as to where he was, but Ava knew something was not right. It was almost like Teresa wanted to act like William, her own son, her only son, never even existed. Ava spent years and years searching for William. It almost became a job for her. She called different police departments, hospitals, shelters, orphanages, social service agencies, anywhere she could think of. She put in time almost every single day trying to locate him, some nights even falling asleep next to the phone book or stacks of papers having to do with her search for him. She said that when she saw the photo released online in 2020, that she knew in her heart that it was him. As soon as she saw it, she screamed. Her daughter came downstairs and she said, this is him. Authorities took her claim seriously, spoke to her more, and decided to go through with further investigating and testing, that being DNA testing with the help of Bodhi technology, to help come to a full conclusion as to whether their John Doe was the boy that she spoke of. On Wednesday, July 13th of 2022, DeKalb County District Attorney Sherry Boston led a press conference announcing the news that after 23 years, the county's little John Doe finally has his name back. And not only that, but they made an arrest in relation to his case. The woman who gave the tip a couple years earlier, Ava, was right about the identity of the boy. His name and life was William Deshawn Hamilton. He was six years old at the time of his death. Ava described him as fun, adventurous, and so intelligent. He loved to dance, draw, color, crack jokes, and read. That he didn't want you to read to him, he wanted to read to you. Ava had spent a lot of time around William when he was little, even being there to give him his first bath. She just adored him and never gave up on him. She knew that one day she would find him. She would find out what happened to him. She just never expected it to be this way. Sherry Boston stated, for too long, this precious little boy had no name and no story. Through the tireless efforts of several individuals and organizations who were determined not to let this boy be forgotten, William has been identified and justice will be served in his memory. All signs of who was responsible pointed to his mother, Teresa Ann Black, previously Teresa Ann Bailey. On June 28, 2022, a DeKalb County grand jury indicted Teresa for multiple charges, including felony murder, aggravated assault, concealing the death of another, and cruelty to a child. She was taken into custody the next day from her home in Phoenix, Arizona. During her arrest, she was in a wheelchair and was described as having a calm demeanor. She was then extradited back to Georgia and she entered a preliminary plea of not guilty at her arraignment. For many years, we had an idea of what his death was, but we didn't really know. According to Eleven Live, a manner and cause of his death was not determined at the time. The indictment for the mother now alleges that she caused her son's death by giving him a substance or substances containing diphenhydramine and acetaminophen and by striking him in the head with an unknown object. Ava had been friends with Teresa. Obviously, she never thought in a million years that she would have been capable of something like this and she had lost touch with her years back, always thinking, though, that there was more to the story. Ava did tell a and &E TV that Teresa always had been distant and impatient with William, that she wasn't a loving or affectionate mother. William, he was failed by one woman, but other than Ava, another woman never forgot him as well. Ava never forgot him when he had his actual name and it was Angeline Hartman who never forgot him when he didn't yet have it. Angeline Hartman worked for WAGA TV in Atlanta and was the first reporter for them there on the scene to report about the finding of his remains back in 1999. She covered the case for them for six years until she switched careers. She left the studio back in 2005 to work for the show America's Most Wanted where she covered the case on there as well. And then she became communications director for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and continued to work on his case. She told a and &E TV, with each career move, it just stayed with me. I was there from day one and kept doing story after story after story. I would talk about it in normal life too, at a dinner party or at a board meeting. Everyone who knew me knew about it. These two women, 
Ava and Angeline have both become quite close since meeting in July of 2022. Angeline told a &E TV, it's heartbreaking, but it's also beautiful at the same time. I cannot speak enough about how strongly I feel about Ava and what she did and how she just never gave up. In that same article from a &E TV, Ava was quoted saying, it's a joy because I know he lives at peace now that he's been found, but it's always a sadness because seeing him as a child, seeing how happy and intelligent and smart he was, so many possibilities of what he could have done or who he could have been. For now, Teresa Ann Black sits behind bars awaiting the day she stands trial for her son's murder. This would not be her first run-in with the law though, far from it. After she had been arrested, authorities did a little digging into her past and much of the information has been released online. In May of 1994, as only a teenager, Teresa shot and killed a 40-year-old man named Jimmy Lee Samuels. According to Oxygen.com, at the time, Black was living with Samuels and Samuels' girlfriend, Tamika Wooden, then 23, at a boarding house in Southwest Charlotte. It wasn't clear if William Deshaun Hamilton, who would have been two years old, lived with his mother at the residence. Reporting officers stated that Samuels and Wooden had a physical altercation during which Samuels allegedly hit Wooden with a golf club. Black and Wooden then reportedly tried leaving the boarding house, but Samuels chased after the two, prompting another fight between the adult couple. Citing the Charlotte Observer, the Journal Constitution reported the teenage Black fired a warning shot and then shot Samuels in the back. Samuels succumbed to his injuries at an area hospital. Black was initially charged with murder, but pleaded guilty to lesser charges of voluntary manslaughter in September 1994, according to the Journal Constitution. She was released from prison one year later at the age of 18. So yes, Teresa was basically described as not having a motherly spirit and suspiciously leaving an area with her son and returning without him, but now we know that she is in fact capable of murder because she did it before. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, during 1999 to 2003, Teresa had been arrested multiple times in Charlotte after moving back, but these were all non-violent charges. From 2003 to 2010, she didn't have another run-in with the law, but during that year of 2010, she was sued for not paying medical bills. In 2017, she moved to Arizona, and of course, six years later, she would be arrested for the murder of her son from back in 1999. When it comes to her and William's time spent in Atlanta, very little is known, but we do know that they had been staying at the Atlanta Day Shelter for Women and Children, which is a shelter for women and children facing homelessness in Atlanta, Georgia. At this time, she was working at a gentleman's club called Pleasers, which has since permanently closed down. The DeKalb County District Attorney's Office continues to seek information from anyone who knew William Deshaun Hamilton or his mother, Teresa Ann Bailey Black. Anyone with information is asked to call the DeKalb District Attorney's Office cold case tip line at 404-371-2444. Remember that you can stay anonymous. Not much else has been released to the public regarding the case, and honestly, I thought that there would have been a trial already, but I could not find anything about that. I also personally could not find any information regarding any of William's other family members, not even his father. It doesn't seem like his biological father was really in the picture in any way, but I can't say for sure. It's just information kind of left out. It is sad that it just seemed to be Teresa and William on their own, and because of that, he didn't have many others close to him that fought to find out exactly what happened to him besides Ava, someone who was not blood relation to either of them. If you wanna hear more about this case, I will link the press conference below in the description of this video, along with Angeline Hartman's podcast episode for her podcast, Inside Crime. And during this podcast, she talks with both Ava and Lance Cross, who is the director of major crimes at the DA's office. In the podcast interview with Lance Cross, he definitely breaks down the charges against Teresa and and what they really think happened. When I say that this is one of those cases that affected me to my core, I mean it. I had to pause filming two or three times because I just was getting very choked up, especially when it comes to everything having to do with Ava and Angeline just 
not giving up on this child. This is a case that in my mind definitely solidifies the power of the internet. With the advancements in technology and of course very skilled forensic artists, reconstruction photos are becoming more and more accurate. You really never know that by just sharing a reconstruction photo online, it could possibly be shared by another person and another person and then end up on the right person's feed. If you have any thoughts or opinions about this case, definitely leave those down below in the comments. And like always, leave some love for people that worked directly on this case, people that never gave up, people that just loved this little boy. But for now, that is the case of William Deshaun Hamilton. And I hope that eventually I can come back here on my channel and give an update as to how everything panned out. If you have any cases that you possibly want me to cover here on my channel, make sure to send those requests over to gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com and I will see you all in the next one.